about the future of this country than they care about themselves. And with that, Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Can you yield your time to me? Madam Speaker, would under the, it, would under it, the speaker? I was going to say, Madam Speaker, would it be in order for the gentleman to yield the balance of his time to me? The chair will reallocate the time. Thank you. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for the remainder of the hour as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm not going to uh, take the full 30 minutes, but I've been in this Congress for a long, long time. And uh, I've been frustrated a lot. And I think maybe I've learned a little bit. And for any of my colleagues who are in their offices watching on television, I thought I would make a few comments about some of the things that uh, I hope that they will uh, take as a little bit of a, a lesson for them down the road. The first thing that I've been on the Foreign Affairs Committee for 30 years, and the first thing I've learned is that you can't make the world over in our image, no matter how hard we try. There are different cultures, different people, different religions, uh, tribal, all kinds of things. And when we go into another part of the world and try to make them like us, we cause uh, a lot of problems. We cause a lot of lives and we lose a lot of money. We should always realize in the back of our minds that we should do what's in the interest of the United States of America first, last, and always, and not try to make the world look like us. The second thing that I think my colleagues, I hope they realize, is that we're going to have to work with some pretty unsavory persons sometime. Muammar Gaddafi was a terrible, terrible tyrant in Libya. And when Ronald Reagan had to deal with him after he bombed a nightclub that killed a lot of Americans in Germany, Ronald Reagan flew the planes over and bombed Gaddafi. And Gaddafi wasn't a problem anymore. A lot of people were killed. He was almost killed. And he realized that terrorism from his country was not going to stand. And so Gaddafi was not a problem for the United States from then on. Now he was a problem in his country. He killed a lot of people and there might have been some more carnage, but it was in his country. And because of that, we went into Libya, spent billions of dollars of our money, we drove him out of office and had him killed, and uh, now there's chaos over there. And they killed our ambassador, they tortured him, I understand. I won't go into the details, but it was pretty bad. They killed three other people. They burned our flag, and the place is in chaos. So what did we get when we got rid of Gaddafi? He was a bad guy. He was terrible to his own people. But what we have now is a complete chaotic situation in that part of Africa. The same thing's true in Tunisia. And then, of course, our president went over to Egypt, and he gave a speech talking about how we all had to get along and how there ought to be democracy in Egypt. Now Mubarak, who was the dictator over there, was a bad guy. But he had lived up to what we call the Camp David Accords, and the United States and Egypt worked together to make sure there was peace in the Middle East and there wasn't any war going on involving Israel or anything else. But we led the fight to get rid of Mubarak. We did it, along with some help. And now Mubarak is gone, and we have the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, a lot of people don't know much about the Muslim Brotherhood, but they, are a, they have been adjudged a, a terrorist organization in the past. And I was told, and everybody else was told when Mubarak left, that there was going to be democracy, freedom, and human rights in Egypt. We had 78 Coptic Christians just murdered recently. And as you know, they came over and a mob 
And it was planned. Everybody knows about it. It wasn't because of that movie. But they came over and they scaled the walls of the U.S. Embassy. They burned the, Ameri burned the American flag. And they ran around waving the radical Muslim flag. And they touted Obama, or uh, 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 they, uh, they touted their uh, radical leaders as, uh, as uh, the future leaders of that area. Osama bin Laden. They were carrying his picture around saying, we support Osama bin Laden. Now this is a country that we just gave one and a half billion dollars to. Our money. And the reason we gave them that money is because we've been paying them for years and years to make sure that they lived with the Camp David Peace Accords, which meant that there'd be peace between Egypt and Israel and throughout the Middle East. Mubarak's gone, the Muslim Brotherhood's in charge, and there's chaos in Egypt, and the entire Middle East is threatened further. So when you look across the northern tier of Africa, I hope my colleagues will realize, we've tried to create governments that agree with us and look like us and that will be tokens of the United States of America. Instead of leaving them alone, we have helped create chaos. Now, I just got back from the Persian Gulf recently. I was in Bahrain. And Bahrain's a friend of ours. We have the fifth fleet there, which patrols the entire Persian Gulf, protecting those waterways, and we get about 35% of our energy from that part of the world. And Iran is sending people into that country to undermine that government and stir up the people. It's the same thing that happened in Libya, same thing that happened in Egypt, and now it's happening in the, in the Persian Gulf states. And we get a third of our energy. If we don't get that energy, if we don't become energy independent, we're going to have the lights off one of these days, and we're going to be paying about 5 or $6, $7, $8 a gallon for gasoline. And it'll hurt the entire economy. Now, this isn't baloney. This is fact. And the radicals are working in that entire region to take over. And we're trying to help these radicals, or have helped these radicals in a number of countries. And now we've got a real chaotic mess on our hands. Now, yesterday... My colleagues overwhelmingly passed a continuing resolution. Most people don't know what that is, but it's a spending bill that takes us from now until March of next year. And I came down to the floor when the discussion was going on on the recommittal motion, and I said, tell me, is any of that money going to Libya or Egypt? And nobody would answer me. But I can tell you right now, additional monies are going to go to Libya, and additional money is going to go to Egypt, and both of those countries are not friends of the United States. A lady from Congress told me yesterday, she was in uh, Egypt not long ago, and she talked to one of the members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and she said, what, what are the goals that you have? And he says, our goal as the Muslim Brotherhood is to have the Al-Qaeda flag, the Muslim Brotherhood flag, fly over the White House in the United States. Now, he may have been exaggerating a little, but if you look at what the Muslim Brotherhood has said just recently, and their new president, they said they weren't going to involve themselves so deeply in government over there, but they took over the legislative branch, they've taken over the president, and their president recently said he wanted to model their government after Iran. And Egypt is the biggest country in the Middle East. But we went in there, our president went in there and gave a speech, and we said we wanted to change that and get rid of the dictator, the dictator, Mubarak, who was not a good guy, but at least he, he supported the Camp David Peace Accords, which Jimmy Carter worked on, all the way up to now. And now we've got a chaotic situation over there. So we can't make the world over in our image. We should not try to nation build. You know, I supported it. I supported our efforts when we went into Iraq because I thought we had to get rid of Saddam Hussein and I thought we had to stop the movement of radical Islam in its tracks and uh, I thought democracy would be a good thing there but if you look at what's happened the democracy there 
is, is, although it's a fledgling democracy, is very rocky. And they're very close to Iran. They've met with the Iranian leaders, Ahmadinejad. And so this nation building we did in Iraq right now, I think, is still tenuous. I'm not sure it's going to work out. And we spent billions and billions and maybe trillions of dollars over there and lost a lot of lives. And then in Afghanistan, and I support going after the Taliban, I think we ought to get rid of those guys. We ought to stop the terrorists. It's extremely important. But the one thing I think that's very important when we go after these guys is we make absolutely sure that we're going to get them and we're going to win. And the problem we have with Afghanistan now after losing all these lives and costing all this money is that we're going to pull out in about a year and a half. And in my opinion, that, that whole area is going to be again in a state of turmoil. And we will have spent billions of dollars, our treasure, and a lot of lives, and it will still not be stabilized. And I think that's really unfortunate because the problems that we thought we were going to solve by going there. One of the things that bothers me is every time we have a war, we think we can have a war that's antiseptic, that we're not going to kill any civilians. You know, you can go in and, and if you attack an area and you kill the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, you have to be real careful that you don't damage or kill civilians. And as a result, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, they hide behind civilians. They go into schools and churches and they go into uh, hospitals because they know that they can't be attacked unless we go in and there's innocent lives lost. We faced the same thing in World War II, and people don't remember this, but we had to do things to win that war to stop Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo that we would never want to do. We firebombed Dresden, Germany. We firebombed Berlin. We dropped n nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We killed millions of innocent human beings. But that was the horrible cost of war. Now today, with the television and the internet and everything else, we go to war, and the next day you see somebody that's injured, a woman, a child, and they say, this is horrible, we can't conduct this war. So our military is handcuffed. They say that they can't go in and go after these guys in certain areas because of the potential civilian casualties. And you can't run a war like that. You either go in to win or you don't go in at all. And we shouldn't risk American lives and treasure unless we're, unless we're going in to win. That's why when I think back at Iraq, I think back, maybe we should have gone in and beat the hell out of Saddam Hussein, let them know that we weren't going to put up with that, and then pulled out and say, hey, you've got a country, you run it properly, but if you, can, if you conduct yourself in the way you did before, we'll be back. It would have scared Iran to death. It would have scared the Taliban to death. But instead, we went in there and nation build. And 10, 12 years later, we face much of the same thing that, we're going to, that we faced back then. The other thing I think that's important for Congress to do, and we don't do it, is when the administration, I don't care whether it's a Democrat or Republican administration, when they make a mistake, we in the Congress must speak out. We must not just go along with the administration, whoever it is, because we want to keep a good relationship with them. Our responsibility as Congress is to make sure that the government of the United States doesn't go awry. And I've seen time and time again in the years I've been here where presidents have made a mistake and we, send, we stay here and, and we're, we're strangely silent. We have to speak up. We have to let the American people know when mistakes are made and that we have to correct them. And we must not let unelected bureaucrats decide all of our foreign policy. We have people at the State Department, people in our government, people who are unelected, who make decisions that really lead us in the wrong direction. And I, I, I speak again for, for the administration of the State Department when I talk about Libya. We went in there and what did we get? We got rid of Gaddafi, now there's chaos. Now they're attacking our embassy and burning our flag and waving around Al-Qaeda flags and talking about how the world will be better off if all the Muslim radicals are in charge. The same thing is true in Egypt. We went in and got rid of Mubarak. And what did we get? We got the Muslim Brotherhood, a radical Muslim fundamentalist group that wants to destroy the freedoms that we believe in, not to mention our best ally in the entire region, Israel. And Israel is the only place over there that we can, we can count on if everything goes wrong. And so our State Department and the administration 
and previous administrations have made these kinds of mistakes, and we've been strangely, strangely, strangely silent. So I just like to end up by saying to my colleagues, we should profit from our past mistakes. We should make sure that we don't try to nation build. We, we can't make the world over in our image. It's not possible. We have to work with unsavory leaders sometimes, people that we don't like, that we don't think are good people because of stability in the region and because of America's interests. Our interests ought to be number one. The protection of our country ought to be number one. The protection of our soldiers and the people who go to war and the people of this country ought to be number one. And of secondary importance are the lives of these people in these countries that are radical. But we haven't been doing that. But that ought to be our number one goal. The United States of America first, last, and always. And we should not turn over to unelected bureaucrats the control of our foreign policy. We should listen to them. We should have our ambassadors over there. We should have good people over there like the ambassador that just lost his life. But the final decisions ought to be brought before the committees of the Congress, and we ought to discuss them, and we ought to participate in the decision-making process with the commander-in-chief, but not let unelected leaders, bureaucrats, make those decisions. And finally, we must remember we should never go to war unless we realize the cost that is going to be involved. You cannot win an antiseptic war. You can have a, a peace, a tenuous peace. We had that in Korea. We still have the potential for a war over there, the 38th parallel. We didn't go in and we didn't win it, so now we have the communists up north and the freedom-loving peoples down south. Uh, we went into uh, uh, northern Africa, into Somalia. We tried to nation build there and we had to pull out because it, you couldn't get it done. Uh, we, we, we've gone all over the place and tried to nation build. And we've gone all over the world and tried to make the world over in our image. And we've gone all over the world and tried to fight out antiseptic wars and they just don't work. If you're going to fight a war. You have to go in and win it and then leave and do what's right for America. You can't stay there for 8, 10, 12 years and try to nation build because ultimately you lose a lot of life, you spend our treasure and you don't get the job done. And I'm a conservative. I'm one of those guys that is the strongest, one of the strongest supporters of the military in the entire Congress. And I'm one of those people they call a hawk. One of those people that says, you know, get the bad guys wherever they are. But I've learned over the past 30 years that you have to do certain things if you're going to make America great and survive as a nation. And those things are very important. You can't make the world over on our image. You have to work with some Democrats, some leaders in other parts of the world that are not savory people because of our interests and our stability. You can't, you can't spend our money and our treasure and our lives of, uh, of Americans without going in to win. And you can't fight an antiseptic war. If we go in and we go in to win, we're going to have to take some innocent lives, and it's a tragic thing, but that's the way the war is. And the reason Dwight Eisenhower and the American forces were so great and so successful in World War II in Europe and in Japan was because we went in and we did what had to be done to win. And if we hadn't done that, we might all be speaking German today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The things that are going on right now in the world are deeply troubling. For those of us who have studied history, 
it becomes even more disturbing. When we make the same mistakes again, mistakes that get people killed who have entrusted their lives to their government, said, I'm willing to lay down my life for you. I give my life in service to you. And as some of the military, some of our outstanding military in Afghanistan this year have told me sincerely, quote, I'm willing to lay down my life for my country. Please don't waste my life. Unquote. The decisions of a president who has never really gotten involved in foreign affairs, his experience before coming into public offices as a community organizer, that can be fine if you adequately study history and really understand, not from the standpoint of an Indonesian school child and the limited viewpoint that that may yield, but from the standpoint of someone who has studied history inside and out and understands such things as the axiom that when a nation's enemies see that nation's strongest ally or allies pulling away from it, that's when they move. The old axiom that among nations, weakness is provocative. Two years ago, I'd seen an article, and this may have been the one I'd seen because the, the title was Obama Votes Against Israel. Uh, this is an article dated May 29, 2010. Um, and it points out in the article that the White House sided with Israel's enemies, something that this nation didn't normally do, and basically demanding that Israel disclose all their nukes. Well, those who study the Bible, biblical history, may recall that uh, King Hezekiah was a very good king in Israel, and things went pretty well. But Isaiah was sent to confront Hezekiah about what he had done with visitors who had come from Babylon. And God knew what had been done, but Isaiah asked, and Hezekiah explained, and this is Texas paraphrase, uh, the new Texas paraphrase version. But in essence, he said, you know, all these wonderful leaders came over from Babylon, so I showed them all of our treasure. And if you get into the strict interpretation uh, translation, he basically says, I showed them our armory, all of our defenses. And Isaiah points out, you fool, you're going to lose the country because you've done this. No matter what point in history you are, when a nation shows all its defenses to its enemies, that information at some point in time will be used to take down such a foolish nation. Even when a nation discloses all of their defenses to friends, to staunch allies, because as we've seen, we thought we had, the U.S. had a, an ally in Castro in, in Cuba. And yet, once he was in power, he turned rather remarkably against the United States. Those things happen. People, power changes in different countries, and if they have information, if they have weaponry, if they have the wherewithal, then sometimes a former friend can turn into an enemy. 
So it was no surprise to me, being a student of history, that when it came out through the media that, gee, the Obama administration has taken a shocking history or, or a shocking position when looked at historically against Israel's well-being, then was it a shock that the flotilla left within only mere days to go challenge the blockade at the Gaza Strip? Nobody should have been surprised by that because the world, Israel's enemies, had been shown that this administration was willing to pander to Israel's enemies uh, to try to make Israel's enemies think, you know, hey, you know, we're, we're one of you guys. You know, we're just friends. We want to be friends with everybody. It doesn't work that way. You don't throw your friends under the bus, and you don't gain friends by paying off enemies. It has never worked. It will never work. It gets people killed. So Israel's been in a bit of a bind. And when we see the way this fiasco over the last year and a half has been handled, some might say, look, this is no time to be talking about these things. For goodness sakes, decisions are being made as I speak that will either let people live or get people killed. If we don't talk about it now, when will we talk about it? Let the historians write that nobody would stand up and say, this is a mistake. Let's don't repeat the terrible chapters of history. Let's get it right. All of us who served in the United States Armed Services took an oath and had it cross our mind. You know, the time may come where I do have to lay down my life for my country but after I had a soldier say that in Afghanistan, I had to realize, you know, I, I had that in the back of my mind. I'm willing to lay down my life. I hope it doesn't get wasted. Well, the thing is, every American that has laid down their lives for their country didn't do it for this administration or any other. There were ideals that this country was founded on and stands for even now. But we're in the midst of a crisis. And part of it created by our own mishandling. And we have got to make sure that we do not continue to make the same mistakes and continue to pander to our enemies and continue to provoke them by showing weakness. We owe the lives that have been laid down that are even now coming, being brought back into this country. We owe them an obligation to make sure that others do not lose their lives unless it really counts. I come over here nauseated today upon hearing reports about, and I pray God they're not accurate, about what may have happened during the eight hours or so, the body of our great ambassador was missing. But we also know, well, gee, the embassy in Cairo released a statement, and they were basically condemning um, anybody that would produce a provocative film that might offend Muslims. Good grief, how many movies have been produced that provoke and insult those of us who are Christians. Thank God that most of us as Christians understand that that does not justify going and killing people and burning people and burning up buildings. We understand that we believe in freedom of speech that God gave us freedom to make choices. And so in the most ideal country, others will have freedom to choose right and freedom to choose wrong. 
But if it's too wrong, we have criminal laws domestically to deal with those issues. But you would hope someone, before any further action is taken, to condemn Americans for using freedom of speech here will analyze the situation as they did not before they first condemned and even had a general officer of our military call and ask about maybe not producing a film, not pushing it out there, whatever it was he asked. Don't use your First Amendment rights that I'm supposed to be fighting for you to have. Don't use those. Uh, that'll make my job easier. Well, actually, the general doesn't know. It makes it more difficult. Let's look at this. Let's analyze it a moment. Friend Patrick Poole asked a question that made me start asking questions. Let's look at it. You know, we, we, uh, we heard about this film that all of a sudden on 9-11, shouldn't that ring a bell, on 9-11 provoked riots. It provoked people in Cairo climbing up the walls of our embassy. And it's easy to watch these things happen. You know historically that, that people will push the envelope, and these people did in Cairo. Well, I wonder if the soldiers will stop us if we go up to the wall. And maybe they go up and spray paint on the wall. Whoa, nobody stopped us from there. How about if we climb on the wall? Well, no soldiers. They watched. They didn't do anything. They just watched. Oh, well, let's push it a little further. Let's climb up the walls. Wow, we're up here on top of the walls, and these soldiers that are supposed to protect the embassy have done nothing. Let's take down the American flag. That's always popular here. Let's run up an Al-Qaeda-type flag. And nothing was done. That is provocative in its weakness. Now, this film is still a mystery. It, it still, it, it, it should make people go, wait a minute, this, this doesn't make sense. That all of a sudden this film provoked nations of people, masses of people to come out and riot, and it would cause them to kill an ambassador and innocent people. This film, let's look at this a little more carefully. And then you find a story that actually turns out there's a report that this, uh, this movie came out in July. So, a movie that nobody notices, nobody pays any attention to, comes out in July. Well, if this ridiculous movie, this insulting movie that insults Muslims, we're told, I haven't seen it, don't plan to. But it came out in July. How on 9-11, all of a sudden... Does this movie cause people to be killed? And I would humbly submit that a lesson to learn here is that when American citizens utilize their free speech right, their freedoms of religion, that the president and everyone under his command is not to direct that people can't use their freedom of speech and freedom of religion. They're to protect them. And the messages that should come out from an administration or not, don't use your freedom of speech and freedom of religion because we don't want to offend anyone. I'm offended all the time. You don't go kill people because of it. And under Western law, although it's not recognized under Sharia law, under Western law of Western civilization, we dealt with this all the time in the court over which I was a judge. Provoking words, no matter how insulting, provoking words are never a defense to a physical assault, much less murder. That's what we believe in this country. That's what Western civilizations believe. 
we should be defending that civilized concept, not pandering to people who are being inflamed by our enemies. So then we find out that the inflammation of people who would kill American citizens and American ambassador were inflamed by this film that came out in July, but it was not until it was released through the Egyptian media that it started firing people up. Wow, isn't that remarkable? Right before 9-11. Well, now, if it's an insulting movie, and, and from the information we have, the Muslim Brotherhood is basically in control in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood basically could shut down any Egyptian media source. But yet, they produce or they, they get this information, they get the film out there. Not only that, because there are some Muslims that may not speak English that might be inflamed into a fire that will burn down buildings and kill people, we better interpret that into their language. Gee, why would a, a foreign country who this president says has been our ally, and then he said they're not our ally, but they're not our enemy, and then we hear, well, actually, we do consider them an ally. Whatever they are, a friend does not take some obscure film that nobody noticed, interpret it into a language that it knows will inflame people who will kill Americans, and put it out there. That's not a friend. That's an enemy of the United States of America. And it is an insult to this government, to the American people, that this body would vote for a continuing resolution that allowed the potential for more money to go to enemies that would put out films that will inflame people that get Americans killed. We owe those who have given their lives better than this. And we owe those who are serving us abroad and serving here at home and may be sent better than this. So there are those who may say, we should not be talking about this. If we don't talk about it now, others may give their lives and let's save their lives for something more important than a mistake by an administration. Our ambassador to Libya is a hero. I've been to too many funerals of brave men and women who have given their lives for this country. So when I read a report from a media source that discloses the name of a for former SEAL team member who is acting as private security at our facility in Libya, and the report is, doesn't put it in quotes, but the report says that uh, the administration released the information that this former SEAL member was killed while running for cover. Now, I recognize that there are enough in the mainstream media who are so loyal, they take their marching orders. They may not lay down their lives, but they'll lay down their reputations for this administration. Somebody may be willing to come forward and say, well, you know what, it's not exactly what the administration said. Maybe we misinterpreted that in the story. It doesn't matter. The story came out, and the administration owes those who have given their lives for that administration better than that, because I can guarantee you I know enough SEAL members and I know enough former SEAL team members that that SEAL team member was not running for cover when he was killed. If he was running, it was getting to, a, to get to a place from which he could conduct a better assault upon the enemy. That's the way they think. They don't think run for cover. They think, where can I get to the best position to fight to save those entrusted to my care? That's an insult. 
And I hope I never see another report like that from this administration or any Republican administration because it's an insult and we owe better than that to those who are fighting for us. Who made the decision in the Egyptian government, in the Egyptian media, to take this July obscure and from what we hear, pitifully made film and blow it up in the Middle East, figuratively speaking. Figuratively speaking, blow it up in the Middle East so that people that heard it and saw it would blow up Americans. Who made that decision? And who made the decision, we need to know, who made the decision to release a statement that was provocative in its weakness in saying, you know what, uh, people over here are getting upset because some idiot made a film back in the United States, and so we, we, we need to be sure not to insult Muslims. When have I ever seen anything from this administration say, you know what, uh, we, we need to not make films in Hollywood that insult Christians, people like Mother Teresa that deserve better treatment than that? When have I seen that? We haven't because this has been, in the past, a free country where we have freedom of speech and freedom to make stupid, ridiculous, insulting movies. But the obscure film this State Department apologized for had to be translated. It was translated by somebody. It had to be put on Egyptian television by somebody. Who could that have been? And I would submit that until we find out, there should not be a dime of American money, nor money that Americans have had to borrow in order to send to Egypt. Shouldn't go over there. Shouldn't go to, shouldn't go to Libya. And it's time we wake up and quit playing stupid, silly games like this administration is doing with our dear friend Israel and understand decisions have consequences. And when this administration sided with Israel's enemies in May of 2010, it had consequences. People were hurt. People were killed. When this administration perhaps pouting, whatever the reason. Well, I'm going to, and Beyonce, Jay-Z, I understand they're fantastic entertainers, but you've got a country named Israel that has been a friend that has enemies at the gate. And there's not a better way to say it. While we are pandering and playing and actually trying to make our enemies like us by offering to buy them offices in Qatar to let their murdering thugs out so they can murder again while we're playing these th games thinking, gee, maybe our enemy will start liking us. The enemy is at the gate and those centrifuges that are spinning in Iran are a modern-day mass of gas chambers that are being constructed for Israelis and for Americans. Read what their leaders have said. Listen to what their leaders have said. There's one way to stop them. That is to be serious that we will take out anyone who wants to annihilate Americans or America. And when they know we're serious, we may not have to go do it. But it cannot be a bluff. People need to know the American people will not allow innocent American citizens to be target practice. And for those who do not know enough history to know that in the, the song that our Marines are so proud of, that... I, as a grade school child, learned to sing in public school. To the shores of Tripoli, Marines have been fighting our country's battles. 
Those shores of Tripoli came when the Muslim Barbary pirates were attacking American ships. And at that early time in our history, we didn't have a navy. Earlier, we did not have Marines. And it was flabbergasting to people like Thomas Jefferson, who was sent over there to negotiate. Why in the world would you attack Americans? We've never attacked you. We, you ought to look at us as peace-loving. And it was a shock when they were told that actually under our religion, we believe that if we die while attacking infidels, which we consider you to be, we go straight to paradise. Jefferson and others were shocked. This doesn't mesh with most world religions. What religion would, would, would think it okay would actually, you would get to paradise by killing innocent people. Thank God that the vast majority of Muslims don't believe that. But it is pure folly to ignore those that do. We owe those who serve the United States of America better than this. And to those who would say, this is a political season. We should not be talking about anything but jobs. I would say before this economy can thrive, we have got to fulfill our oath to provide for the common defense. Because an economy won't last much longer if we don't protect those who are Americans here and abroad. Uh, I pray for the wisdom of President Obama of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, of those who are serving abroad these United States of America, and for our leaders in Congress, that though we are so close to an election, what will matter more is the fulfillment of our oath and the protection as best we can of those who are trying to protect us. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman have a motion to adjourn? Madam Speaker, at this time I move that we do now hereby adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. According to the House, accordingly, the House stands adjourned until noon on Tuesday next. Thank you. The House today.